Vorrei ringraziare vivamente i nostri colleghi all'Accademia de France, all'Accademia di San Luca e all'Accademia di Belle Arti per l'invito e per la loro graziosissima accoglienza. È un grande onore partecipare con una così distinta adunanza, come dicevano gli accademici del Seicento. This invitation to speak at a conference on artists' academies prompted me to revisit the early history of the Academia di San Luca and to reconsider the ways in which the Roman Academy of Painters, Sculptors, and Architects did and did not serve as a model for the Académie Royale de Peinture et de Sculpture in Paris, established in 1648, as we heard many times yesterday, and for the French Academy in Rome, established in 1666. As it happens, there were along that well-trod road from Rome to Paris a number of stones that had still been left unturned. I will focus on observations that arise from rereading the documents of the Académie di San Luca at a particularly rich Francophilic moment in the early Seicento. I hope, however, that these speculative thoughts will shed light on the reasons why the French chose to model their own artist's academy, not on the more mature and smoothly run Academia del Disegno in Florence, which was founded even earlier in 1563, but rather on the fractious, unevenly administered Academia di San Luca, which was only incorporated in 1593. At a very practical level, there were precious few academicians in the Florentine institution before the 18th century. Jacques Callot, uh, who was, for example, in Florence from about 1611 on, um, as far as I know, never matriculated at the Academia del Disegno. This anomaly points to another reason why the Academia di San Luca is the template for the French Academie. It was the academy that the greatest number of French artists knew and in which they had participated firsthand, especially during the decade of the 1620s. As Edouard Pommier states, it was also the academy with the best record of publications that one could actually consult. It is important from the outset to understand just how fraught the situation in Rome had been pri immediately prior to the election of Simon Vouet. Um, he, and he was, in this case, uh, the curatore dei forestieri, uh, as first mentioned in 1624. He was named as the, later as the first French principe of the Academia. But since I wanted to point to the work of Elisa Camboni in the brand new catalog that just was issued, um, and she's written so well about this period, I'm sorry that I have to repeat a little bit of that information because it wasn't available until just today. Vouet's immediate predecessor, Antivirutto Grammatica, had been relieved of his duties for reasons that the biographer Baglioni described as misguided, if not criminal. Grammatica had attempted to concentrate the power of the ac academy in the hands of a group of 25 senior statesmen known as La Coletta. And he had proposed selling one of the academy's prized possessions, right here. I hate to even show the slide now. <laughs> you get to see the difference between the slide and the original. Um, these episodes are significant and deserve closer scrutiny than they have so far received. However, they serve here as prelude both to internal reforms and to the ascendancy of the French artists within the academia. Coincidentally, Grammatica's defenestration also marked the second year of Urban VIII's papacy and the first recorded appearances of from Francesco Maria del Monte, the academy's cardinal protector since the late 1590s, who attended a meeting. Del Monte, rumored to be discreetly pro-French, was clearly brought in to restore order to the battered institution. One of the first items on Del Monte's agenda for the full congregazione of painters and sculptors on the 20th of October in 1624 was the election of a new prince. Um, I have not yet seen any direct in, in, um, information or evidence that he gave the academia an ultimatum that made it uh, absolutely necessary that it be voué, but um, we do see this happening later in the 1620s uh, when Cassiano del Pozzo and um, eventually Cardinal Francesco himself make appearances and say, 
this person will be the next prince. At the same time, the cardinal oversaw the revival and reorganization of the teaching and charitable functions of the academy. In addition to Vouet, we find the names of dozens of French artists who were uh, assigned to positions of prominence, including not only painters, but also embroiderers. Many scholars from Lonchardier to Rosenberg to La Franconi and also Elisa Camboni have remarked on the large contingent of French artists present in the academia at this time. The influx of French artists continued unabated throughout the decade, as can be seen in the snapshot of a congregazione of the 29th of September, 1626, where we find, among others, Claude Monlon, Jean et Jacques Lhomme. Um, Jean, uh, Jacques Lhomme and Charles Malin and others um, had, in fact, studied with Rouet. The same day, Poussin and Valentin de Boulogne were named Festeroli for the upcoming feast day of St. Luke on the 18th of October. Almost all of these artists also lived, however briefly, uh, with or near uh, to Vouet during the 1620s. There's an incredible amount of uh, overlap with, uh, with Vouet himself, which, to my mind, suggests that this colony was not casual, but created. What has escaped notice or comment is that the French not only attended meetings, but contributed uh, to the financial stability and helped to reanimate the pedagogical program of the academia since 1622. The academy was, in my estimation, in real financial crisis, and as one means of remedying the situation, they had opened the membership to guilders and embroiderers from whom they expected to receive dues and alms. On the 12th of September, 1627, for example, Jacques Stella was appointed alms collector for the French nation. It is significant, too, that during the 1620s, this Nazione Francese becomes so identified, an actual entity within Rome that had financial and institutional wherewithal, usually exceeding all others in raising alms for the academia. And it was Vouet who helped to galvanize that community. Vouet is noteworthy for having taken in, um, part in diplomatic missions since his youth. In 1590, he was sent to London, supposedly to paint the portrait of a French noblewoman. And in 1611, Philibien reports that he accompanied the French ambassador. And I made a connection with, because uh, there are uh, now historical lists of the ambassadors, that it was probably Achille de Arlet de Sancy uh, went together to Constantinople in order to paint a portrait of the Sultan. Subsequently, Louis XIII named Vouet pensionnaire at Rome in 1613, and he arrived there uh, by way of Venice about 1614. According to Bousquet, he replaced René Lefranc, whose dates are unknown, in this role when the latter died prematurely. Lefranc's letter of appointment from Henri IV would likely have been very similar to Vouet's own, should it be found, and it deserves to be quoted. So excuse me now for a uh, slightly long quotation. Ayant reconnu l'inclination que René Lefranc, jeune garçon, avait à la peinture, afin qu'il se puisse rendre capable de me faire quelques jours de service, je lui ai fait apprendre le guitar. Et parce que, ayant quelques beaux commencements, il s'en va à Rome pour voir tant de bons maîtres et belles œuvres qui y sont, et par là, avec une étude, se rendre excellent en sa vocation. Je vous dirai que vous ferez chose qui me sera très agréable de la favoriser à s'établir. En ce que vous pourrez, lui faire voir ce qui sera de beau en la peinture, et en avoir paternellement soin, afin qu'il puisse réussir à ce qu'il est destiné. Comme je me suis promis. Thus, these young pensionnaires were selected for their talent and their promise and received support directly from the king, sometimes from the queen mother. Further, the pensionnaires did keep tabs on each other, sometimes lived in the same house as Vouet and the sculptor Christophe Cochet, um, known in Rome as Cristoforo Cochetti. Um, they're listed in the same residence in Via Serena during the Stati d'Anime of 1618. Cochet, who was supported by Marie de Medici, sculpted this Dido uh, for the Duc de Montmorency, and it's thought to have been regifted to Richelieu, and it's now in the Louvre. 
I was pleased to find Coschetti among the stimatori who were appointed in a meeting of the Academie de San Luca in 1624. These kinds of new connections will, one hopes, illuminate the interrelationships of the French artists as well as their interactions with the Academia. Such was the case with Enrico Trevers, Formerly, uh, this painting was attributed to Vouet himself, and now it's thought to be a self-portrait of um, Trevo, um, his name is spelled in a very unusual way, Trevoel, um, and he was studying, in fact, with Vouet in 1622, which we know from other sources. And just yesterday, a colleague of mine said that we added another French sculptor to uh, the academia in this period, and that is Guglielmo Bertolotti, who is better known in French as Guillaume Bertollet. And that was, as I said, 1617. Vouet rose to the position of a prince of the academia within a decade of his arrival in Rome. He served for two and a half years, uh, from 1624 to 27, before he was called back to Paris by Richelieu and on behalf of Louis XIII. Uh, Richelieu might have been particularly well disposed to Vouet's artistic and diplomatic skills based on his friendship with Arlé de Sancy I mentioned earlier. As a successful administrator, Vouet's long principate effectuated substantive change within the academia and at his final congregazione on the 29th of June, 1627, Vouet was honored by the academicians for having led the academy diligently and vigilantly and in particular for having opened the studio which we know uh, from this image of Pier Francesco Alberti, that is for re-energizing the academia's teaching functions, for having reformed the statutes of the academy, for many useful actions on behalf of the Church of St. Luke and the academia, and for giving of his effort and his treasure for the public benefit. All this is a statement made at his departure. This filo francese sentiment within the academia parallels the deployment of Cardinal Francesco Barberini's legation in Paris from March uh, to December of 1625, during which he met and negotiated with Richelieu. In many ways, the artistic diplomacy <clears throat> was more successful than the political campaign. And one of the speculative points I wish to raise is whether part of Louis XIII's and perhaps Richelieu's motivation in calling the famous and successful Vouet back to Paris was in fact to explore the founding of the Artists' Academy there. In addition to having won prestigious commissions from the Barberini, the Sacchetti, Cassiano, uh, and the Fabrica of St. Peter's, Vouet received accolades for his administrative skills while a pensionnaire in Rome. Although Vouet had long been thought to have opposed the founding of the Académie Royale de Peinture et de Sculpture, his competence in directing the Academia in Rome argues for, rather than against, his appreciation of the benefits of an artist's collective. Indeed, Vouet was elected the prince of the rival Académie de Saint-Luc in Paris, which was the successor to the Mastership Guild. Further, the repatriated Vouet here seen in a print by Robert van Vorst after a painting by van Dyck, um, holding the Trattato della Nobiltà della Pittura. I don't know that anybody has made any comment about this yet, but this text that he's holding in his hand was in fact published by the Académie San Luca in Rome in 1585, avant la lettre, before the Academy was actually established. And its subject is the nobility and liberality of painting. Vouet was a skilled director of a large studio, one charged with the decoration of the Palais de Luxembourg, uh, the Palais du Louvre, and Saint-Germain-en-Laye. In addition, Vouet's studio produced such future luminaries as François Perrier, Charles Lebrun, Charles-Alphonse uh, Dufournoy, Pierre Mignard, Eustache Le Sueur, Michel Dorigny, and Claude Malon. I'm showing you uh, one of the many prints that Malone made after Vouet's work, here the allegory of the human soul, which is on view in the Artemisia exhibition across the town. Malone had been living with Vouet in Rome just prior to his call from Louis XIII. As such, he appears to straddle both ends of Vouet's Roman career. Lebrun, who went on to be a founder and celebrated director of the Académie Royale in 1648 and of the Académie de France in Rome in 1666, cut his precocious teeth with Vouet before being sent to Rome. Thus, I would like to return to a point made by William Crelly some 50 years ago, 
that we should be careful not to overread either Vouet's defense of the maitrise um, or his opposition to the establishment of the Académie Royale. Vouet did, after all, found an alternative Académie and became its first, if short-lived, prince from 1648 to 49 when he died. Both the Académie and the mastership foundered after Vouet's death and both eventually closed. Paradoxically, three of Vouet's former pupils were among the 12 founders of the Académie Royale de Peinture. They included Lebrun, Le Sueur, et Perrier. If by the 1640s, Vouet's star was eclipsed by that of Poussin and his academic aspirations dampened by those of Pierre Seguier, um, who is chancellor and protector of the Académie Royale, and of Charmois, its director, he nonetheless made substantive contributions to the future of French painting by means of imparting to his students the pedagogical methods based on the centrality of drawing, uh, this one uh, recently attributed to Vouet, um, especially life drawing, he had assimilated in Rome and had reinstated as part of the regular lessons of the Académie de San Luca and subsequently in a studio in Paris. Even within Vouet's own artistic development, we witness an increasing use of drawing as a means of planning and refining his compositions and decorative cycles. If he began his career as a uh, on the Caravaggist model of working directly from life, by the time Vouet returned to Paris, he had adopted a more Caravaggesque method of refinement of nature through successive stages of drawing. The recent exhibition of Vouet's work in Nantes and Besançon introduced about a dozen new drawings to the artist's Roman oeuvre. The practice of teaching and planning large-scale projects through drawings had the additional benefit of unifying and directing the work carried out by the studio, however large. As Barbara Bergen de Lavagnier makes clear in her studies of the uh, drawings of Vouet's school, there is great confusion about the hands of the individual artists. And I'm showing you here one attributed to Charles Lebrun and another uh, possibly by Le Sueur, but certainly in the circle of Vouet, of a dead Christ. Further, Vouet encouraged his students to make the journey to Rome to imbibe its lessons, as we observe in the pilgrimages made by Perrier in 1635 to 44, Lebrun, 1642 to 46, and Pierre Mignard, who was with Vouet in the 1630s and in Rome from 1635 to 57. Of these, I wanted to highlight the important contribution made by Perrier, who studied both with Lanfranco in the 1620s and with Vouet in the 1630s. Perrier's Segmenta Nobilium Signorum et Statuorum uh, provided visual recordi of the principal works of ancient sculpture in Rome, and it served both as a catalog of antiquities for those who had not yet traveled to Rome and as a memento for those who had. Perrier embarked on the Segmenta the year after he left Vouet's studio, and it is tempting to think that the plan for this Museum Cartacium this eight years before his collaboration with Bellori on the Icones et Segmenta, may first have been hatched in conversations with Vouet. More important, Vouet's encouragement of his students to study in Rome prefigures the Academie's eventual awarding of residency prizes. The popularity of Perrier's prints marks the beginning of the French cataloging and evaluation of the antiquities of Rome, for which you can see Stéphane Loire's work. It is therefore not surprising that several of these works such as the Sleeping Ariadne, or Cleopatra, as it was known for a while, um, were appropriated a century and a half later by Napoleon in 1797 and briefly on view in Paris from 1800 to 1815. My preliminary thoughts about Vouet's importance to later developments um, uh, first that uh, his presence in Rome in general and his tenure as Principe in particular attracted many other French artists to the Eternal City. Second, that his administrative skills were honed in the academia. Third, that his highly effective teaching and working methods were tempered in the forge of Rome. And finally, that together, these experiences impelled the early formation of the Académie de Peinture et de Sculpture in Paris. In conclusion, I want to redirect the conversation towards the latter history of both the Académie de San Luca and the more intertwined relationship that develops with the Académie in Paris and the Académie Française de Rome in the mid-17th century. Here again, it is instructive to look at the historiography. 
On one hand, the linking of the fortunes of the French and the Roman academies finds voice as early as 1655 in the new rules of the Académie presented to the French Parliament. À l'exemple de l'Académie de peinture et de sculpture dite de Saint-Luc, florissant et célèbre à Rome. On the other, I was struck by the number of times the French and even some Italian uh, writers pointed falsely, in my view, to this idea of le beau, um, or l'idea del bello, as the galvanizing force behind the establishment of the Academy in Rome. Uh, for example, Jean Arnaud's um, History of the Academy in Rome, that is the Academy of St. Luke in Rome in the late 19th century, does not address the early history of the Academia other than as a source for the pedagogical and aesthetic programs of the French Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and that is for the study of the classical past as a standard of le beau. However, the word beau, or bello, beauty, is never found in the incorporating papal briefs of 1577, 1588, or the deputy's mission statement for the academia that's so important in 1593. Il Bello does appear as one of dozens of topics of the lectures presented in the academia during the first year of formal instruction. More important, I contend, is that Il Bello does not appear prominently in the life of the academia before Giovanni Pietro Bellori's lecture presented to the academicians in 1664. Nonetheless, the Academia di San Luca's proximity to the remnants of the Roman past and its centrality to the history of the French Academie, both in Rome and in Paris, became subsumed between the mid-17th and the 19th century into the master narrative of the Academie and of the Ecole. The rapport between the French and Roman academy academies did, however, find a champion in Bellori, who in his dedication of the lives of 1672 to Jean-Baptiste Colbert, then superintendent of buildings and soon to be minister of finances, poetically invoked the ideas taking flight between Rome and Paris. And about this claim, Bellori is surely right. By the 1630s, the Académie de San Luca had reinstated the Académie um, as Federico Zucchero called them, that is uh, these conversations and presentations in the Academy. They were engaged in learned discourse um, and I call your attention to the work of Charles Dempsey in our Academia Seminars volume on the use of disputations as a form of argument. Although we lack one of the earliest and most famous of these, the disputa between Saki and Cortona in the 1630s, the Academia began to be regularly recorded in the mid-17th century. As such, they serve as a model for and precursor to the famous Conférence of the Académie. And like the Roman counterpart, the founding years of the Académie Royale in the late 1640s and early 1650s were fraught with challenges from the Mastership Guild, the alternative Académie de Saint-Luc, and to a certain extent, the fallout from La Fronde. By 1654, however, the fledgling Académie Royale was rewarded for putting its faith in the king and not in the guilds. In their new statutes of that year, they gained a protector, in this case, one of Louis XIV's ministers, Cardinal Mazarin, the nominal director was Antoine de Ratebon. And uh, very much on the Italian model, uh, this system of the Académie di San Luca, or for that matter, the Académie del Disegno in Florence. In that year, the Académie Royale also established the annual student prize, <clears throat> later known as the Rome Prize, and inaugurated its own set of monthly lectures, or conférences. Although founded almost 75 years apart, Yet, under similarly difficult circumstances, by the mid-1660s, there was a great deal of consonance between the academies in Rome and Paris. Both were established by a direct fiat from uh, the sovereign. Both were under the watchful eye of a protector who had the ear of the sovereign. Both provided lessons in life drawing for the members, and both were embarked on pedagogical missions, though uh, their lectures for members, or excuse me, through their lectures for members, which were meant in their own words, to inculcate skills that would eventually be reflected in their brushes and in their colors. Thank you very much. Ringrazio Peter Lucart e invito Rachel George dell'Ecole Pratique des Hautes Études a a presentarci il suo intervento che è Considerazione sull'evoluzione dei precepti dell'Académie all'Académie di San Luca de Rome o Seicento. <coughs> 